Okay, um, well, thank you everyone for having me here. Uh, my name is Grayson, as um, was introduced. Um, I'm a security engineer at R2C, and today I'm going to be talking about detecting complex code patterns using semantic grep. Um, so a little bit about myself. Um, this is me and my wife over here. Uh, my name is Grayson. As Sam mentioned, uh, in a previous life before I worked at R2C, I worked for the U.S. Department of Defense doing all manner of things. Um, but now I work for R2C, which is a um, San Francisco static analysis startup on a mission to profoundly improve software security and reliability. And down here is our modern COVID times team photo. Um, and so I want to take a second and just give a shout out to everybody uh, on the photo and even some who are not. Um, R2C is a great place. Uh, it's a great team to work for and work with. Um, and everything that you see here would not be possible without the contributions of every single team member. Uh, it's great. Um, they're all extremely motivated, highly intelligent, and it's, it's a great place to, to work. So special shout outs to all of them and a special thanks from me uh, because it's an honor to work with them all. So uh, the too long didn't watch of this talk is that writing secure code is hard. Um, static analysis tools are too noisy or too slow. Uh, grep isn't expressive enough for finding what you want in source code. And so uh, what we need is something that's fast, code aware, flexible, powerful, and open source. Enter SEMGREP uh, or semantic grep. Uh, SEMGREP is a fast and syntax aware semantic code pattern search for many languages, which is a huge mouthful to say. And so uh, an easier way to think of it is that it's like grep, but specifically for code. You can use SEMGREP to search code. You can use it to find security bugs, vulnerabilities. You can use it to guard your code and force specific best practices or uh, patterns. And you can also use it uh, to migrate up from old deprecated or insecure APIs. And I'll uh, demonstrate a little bit of each of these uh, as we go through the talk. So as an example, really fast, um, of using SEMGRIP to search code. We at R2C have used it to great effect to find vulnerabilities in open source projects. And so these are just a couple of CVEs that we've had issued as a result of SEMGRIP rules. So CVE is on the left. The specific SEMGRIP rule uh, is listed here and a description of the vulnerability is here. So um, pretty neat stuff. Uh, it, it enables um, a, a lot of really cool things. So from here, the rest of the talk is gonna be laid out like this. Uh, we're gonna go a little bit of a, over a little bit of a background of SEMGREP. We're gonna talk about GREP versus abstract syntax trees and tools which uh, use both. And then we're gonna dive in and do a lot of SEMGREP examples. So we're gonna learn it live. We're gonna do a lot of demos live. And so I hope that the demo gods smile favorably upon me today. Um, and then we'll spend just a little bit of time at the end talking about integrating SEMGREP into CI/CD pipelines because um, code patterns are great, but if you're their their real power comes when you automate the whole process. And then we'll talk about a community rule registry that R2C maintains. So uh, as mentioned, SEMGREP is open source. You can go right over to the GitHub page and check it out. You can browse the source code. You can uh, literally check it out or you can investigate it. <laughs> um, yeah, you can grab an issue if you wanna contribute, anything like that. The um, extremely high level architecture is that the core of SEMGREP is written in uh, OCaml. And then there is a Python wrapper around the OCaml core that adds a lot of uh, niceties to the experience. SEMGREP has a long history of being open source. Um, it was initially developed at Facebook uh, by this gentleman here on the left, Yoan, and was used there to enforce a lot of security rules. Um, so Yoan joined R2C in uh, July of last year. Um, he has a PhD from INRIA and was a con contributor to Coxinel, uh, which was the predecessor to SEMGREP, but specifically for the C language. Speaking of languages, uh, SEMGREP has uh, mainline support for Go, Java, JavaScript, and Python. Um, we, and then we have limited support for several other languages to include Ruby, TypeScript, OCaml, PHP, and C. And we're always adding more uh, in the works right now are Kotlin and C Sharp. 
So that was a little bit of a background about SEMGREP, where it came from and what it's for. And now I wanna take a second and talk about GREP and abstract syntax trees or ASTs. So if you've ever used GREP to try to find uh, patterns in code before, you may be familiar with this experience. So these are some, pat let's say you're trying to find exec, like uh, instances of exec in your code base. These are many different ways in which that um, pattern could show up in your code over here on the left. And so starting out, um, the first two are pretty easy uh, to express as a regular expression or in grep. Um, all you have to do is check for exec and a parenthesis, an open parenthesis. Um, the second two are a little bit more complicated because now you have to begin handling white space or new lines. And then the last three are incredibly complicated because the other exec function might be one that you don't even want to find in the first place. You might start detecting comments or you might start detecting string literals. And so if you wanted to express this in regular expressions, you can imagine just how complicated this would get over time. So this is the classic XKCD of trying to use regular expressions to solve one of your problems and then regular expressions becomes one of your problems. And this is exactly what we experience when we try to uh, find code using regexes uh, with any degree of precision. So the reason for this is because fundamentally code really isn't a string, it's a tree. And so if you remember back to like compilers or programming languages, if you've ever taken one of those classes, during the process of converting a programming language into machine code, it goes through a process where it eventually gets transformed into what's called an abstract syntax tree or an AST. And those tend to look like um, this toy example here on the right. And so if you um, wanted to use the abstract syntax tree to be much more precise in matching specific code patterns, there exist a number of ways to do that in uh, pretty much every language. And there also exists a handful of open source tools that uh, use the abstract syntax tree of the language for uh, security checking. Um, some examples of that include Bandit or Dlint in Python, ESLint for JavaScript, and GoSec for Go. The issue with these is that if you want to add a specific custom rule or a custom check that you want that doesn't already exist, then you now have to become an expert in the AST syntax for the, every language that you want a rule for. So um, every abstract syntax tree works a little bit differently. You interact with it a little bit differently, like different libraries. Um, they, all, the, all of the node have, nodes have different types. And you have to begin to understand all of that if you want to begin to write custom checks. And so if you don't want to do that yourself, you can, of course, pay for it. Um, but commercial tools tend to be a little bit cumbersome. Uh, they're, they don't play well with like modern um, development pipelines. Uh, they can be slow. I've heard that certain commercial static analysis tools can take on the order of days or weeks to finish one run. Um, and of course, they can be expensive depending on um, which one and which licensing model. And so this image really drives it home. This is something that uh, taken from a uh, blog post that came out of Instagram last year, where on the left you have regular expressions, which are really easy to do. They're easy to write, but they are, they're fraught with problems because they lack precision. And then on the right, you have really powerful uh, program analysis, but it can be slow, complex, or cost money. And so SEMGREP lives somewhere in the middle where it tries to maintain this balance between being easy to use, but it still operates on the AST. And so you benefit from the precision of AST-based searching. And so as you'll see in a little bit, um, SEMGREP patterns look like the code you're writing. So you don't have to go learn something new. You don't have to learn a new way of thinking. You just have to write something that looks very similar to the code that you're trying to find. And so this is the key insight that SEMGREP provides, which is that it lets you reason about your analysis the way you reason about your code. And so without further ado, we will jump into some examples and, uh, and see how these go. Um, please let me know if the examples don't show up. I'm going to be navigating to different screens. Um, so uh, yeah, just let me know if uh, something seems broken. 
All right, so let's say you're a security engineer at a company and it has come down from on high that we are banning exec in all of our code. Uh, so we just wanna find all instances of exec and get rid of it out of our code. So that will be the place that we start with. Um, and what I'm gonna do is go over to this page, um, which is a uh, live editor where you can test out um, SEMGREP patterns on code. And so this is um, heavily inspired by Regex 101. If you've ever been to that um, website where you can see, you can like type in your Regex and type in some text and see what matches and what doesn't. So heavily inspired by that. And so similarly, your SEMGREP pattern will be in this top pane here, and the code that you're trying to match will be in this bottom pane here, and then your matches will show up over here on the right. And so to refresh your memory, the example is that we're looking for instances of exec. And as I mentioned before, SEMGREP patterns look very similar to the code that you're trying to find. And so the easiest way to get started is to literally copy and paste um, some code from the code you're trying to find into the into the pattern pane. And if we click run, we will see that it will detect the um, exact thing that we specified, which is perhaps obvious. Um, but what we really want to do is we want to find all instances of exec, not just exec ls or something similar. Um, and so this is the first uh, sort of fundamental operator of SEMGREP, and it's called the ellipsis operator. The ellipsis operator works a little bit like dot star and regex, uh, but what it's doing is it's abstracting away sequences of things. So it's saying, find me zero or more of the kind of thing that would go here in the programming language. Uh, and maybe that's a little bit complicated, but it'll make sense after I demonstrate it. And so what we're gonna do is uh, eliminate the argument from exec. We're gonna put in the ellipsis operator here, which is just three dots. And we're gonna click run. Uh, which is going to match every instance of exec down here in the code pane. And so as you can see, it now matches every instance of exec. And you can see that it has some advantages over regular expressions, such as uh, you don't have to worry about white space, you don't have to worry about new lines, you don't have to worry about trying to determine whether or not it's the right function. Um, it doesn't match the comments and it doesn't match the string literals. And the reason for that is because um, SEMGREP is aware of the abstract syntax tree. It's aware of the fact that this is code and it's matching on the code rather than just on the strings. And so as a result, we don't have to worry about the new lines. We don't have to worry about any of that because it gets rid of all that and parses exclusively as the, the AST. Um, the next example is, let's say you want to search for hard-coded strings in your AWS client. And so um, if you're a Python programmer and have interacted with AWS at all, this might be familiar to you, or you have to pass in like a um, secret access key and an access key ID to your AWS client. And so we'll go over here to the editor again. Um, we will copy the code that we're interested in finding. And if you recall, um, the ellipsis operator abstracts away sequences of things, which means we can also use it in here to say a sequence of characters. And so what we're looking for here is any instance of um, Boto3 client um, where uh, there is a hard-coded string used in either one of these um, parameters. And if we click uh, search, we will find that we pick it up uh, exactly as we expect. But interestingly, <clears throat> what we also pick up is this one. And so these uh, initially look like variables, which we maybe don't want to match. But SEMGREP is smart enough to recognize that this, the only other use of this has been as a static string. And so it will also pick this up because it recognizes that what you're trying to do is match an instance where this is a uh, hard-coded string. So um, that was a little bit about the ellipsis operator and how to use it uh, and how to think about using it. Um, up next, the next examples are going to focus on another um, property of subgroup, which are called meta variables, and I'll explain as I go.
Um, <clears throat> so uh, meta variables operate a little bit like capture groups in regex. And so they like grab a thing and hold on to that thing uh, throughout the operation. And so the example here that I want to bring up is um, the meta variable syntax is in SEMGREP is that you must start it with a dollar sign and then you must use all capital letters after that. <clears throat> and what the meta variable is doing is it's saying, find me some unit of code that belongs here, but I'm not quite sure what it is yet. And so as you can see, the, meta, uh, the pattern that we've specified is the meta variable X with the meta variable Y. Uh, and the equality operator between them. And so we will find, or we will now match um, all of these things. So five equals five, seven equals eight, cat equals cat, some expression equals some expression, and then even something like this, uh, which is another expression, but it's inside like a Python of this comprehension. And so as before, the meta variable says like, there's something here, but I don't know what it is yet. Um, <clears throat> and so some group will do its best to like try to figure that out. Something that is um, really cool about SimGrip2 is that it enforces meta variables to be equivalent. So in the same way that if you're uh, coding something and you reuse the variable X, you would expect it to contain the same data. Um, so SimGrip will operate similarly, where if you say, uh, find me all cases of X is equal to X, um, it will only match situations where the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the equality operator are the same, like this one. So you can see here that it doesn't matter what it is. If they are the same, they will be matched. <clears throat> and so this is a really powerful feature that um, uh, Subgrep provides. Because uh, meta variables can be equivalent, what that means is that we can do things like approximate data flow. And so this example here is a, um, a path traversal vulnerability in the Python Flask framework. And so what can happen is <clears throat> uh, with this code, an attacker can specify a file name that includes um, dot dot and can traverse back up into the file system because there's no sanitization here. Um, and we can use SEMGREP to detect this case where the input, like the attacker controlled input, ends up being sent as a file, which results in a path traversal. So as before, um, we'll start by copying the code over. But the couple of things that we're going to do is we're going to walk through each of these and say, like, which things do we want to abstract away? So first, we don't really care what the route is. Um, so the route would be like the path in a, you know, on a website or something like that. We don't really care what it is, so we're going to abstract it away with the ellipsis operator. Um, <clears throat> we do care what this file name is, but we don't know what the name is. And so like it could be a variable that's named anything. And so we're going to use a meta variable um, to replace there. Um, we don't care about this print statement. And so we're going to abstract it away by saying ellipsis because there could be some amount of code between here and there, that, uh, but we don't particularly care about it. Um, and then the last thing that we want to do is we want to uh, reuse this uh, in order to enforce that these are equivalent. And then uh, we don't care about the rest of these arguments as well. So maybe we want as attachment to be true, but there could be other arguments in the function. So we're going to use ellipsis to say <clears throat> the first thing must match this thing. The first argument must match this, but the rest of it we don't care about. And if we click run, <clears throat> we will see that it picks this up. And so to illustrate my point about uh, meta variables being the same, I will change this to some other file name, and it will no longer pick this up. And so the importance of this example is that it illustrates how to find a security vulnerability using approximate data flow. And so, you know, the file name is like an attacker controlled thing. It gets into a source uh, of a function or method that uh, could expose a vulnerability. And this allows us to uh, search for vulnerabilities in code 
using the SEMGREP with um, much, much more precision than regular expressions would ever provide. <clears throat> so that's a little bit about meta variables. Uh, what I want to talk about next is composing patterns. And so um, you can certainly use SEMGREP to match single patterns, but uh, it becomes even more powerful when you begin to incorporate um, Boolean logic with several patterns. So let's say um, you want to define uh, this is, well, sorry. So this is a Go example. Um, this is Go code where it's setting up a TLS configuration. So trying to uh, encrypt communications between a client and server. Um, but the highlighted things here <clears throat> are things that we want to find. So we want to find insecure TLS configurations where the SSL version is too low. Um, so SSL 3.0 is going to be very vulnerable, easy to break. And then another insecure um, flag in this TLS configuration is insecure skip verify being set to true, which uh, forces a client not to validate the server identity. So it's kind of similar to when you like SSH into something and it says like, hey, here's the fingerprint for the server. Do you want to trust it? Um, it skips that whole process, uh, which can be vulnerable because you might end up talking to a server that you might you don't want to. And so what we want to find in this example are TLS configurations that have either one of these conditions, uh, which sounds a lot like a Boolean or, right? Like we want to find um, a config with this or that or both. Um, and we can do that um, uh, using subgrep. So switch. Um, <clears throat> and so in the editor, you can add in new pattern clauses with these plus buttons, and you can subtract them with the X button. And the dropdown will give you a set series of sort of Boolean operators to work with. And so as I mentioned before, what we're trying to do is find situations where a TLS configuration has this situation or that situation. And so if we use or, uh, we can find TLS configs that have um, either the uh, too low of a SSL version or insecure skip verify set to true. And if we run this, we'll see. <clears throat> we'll see which ones it finds. So the first example that it finds is one where the TLS version is too low and where insecure skip verify is set to true, which is what we want. This TLS version is OK, um, but insecure skip verify is still there, so it still flags. Um, and if we removed this one, then this one will no longer be picked up, uh, but this one will. Um, and so this illustrates how to, compo how to <clears throat> compose patterns together uh, so, such that you can begin finding more and more complicated things. Uh, so now, uh, those are sort of an overview of the fundamentals of SimGrep. I'm going to talk a little bit about some uh, advanced uh, features. And so uh, for the sake of time, I'm probably going to skip this first example, uh, which deals with filtering. Um, so I'll just explain that. Um, in addition to ors, you can also do nots um, with the Boolean logic. And so you can say, like, I want to find this pattern, but I want you to filter out these patterns that match this criteria. Uh, and so SimGrip has that ability as well. Um, if you want to get uh, fancy, you can use inline string regexes. So let's say you want to define, um, let's say you're working with an API where if you use the HTTP scheme like directly in the URL, it will connect um, over HTTP instead of HTTPS. You can use SEMGREP to um, uh, specify a regular expression for that constant string that will only flag if that constant string is met. And so if we go to the editor, I'll show you an example of what this looks like. The pattern here is like a new HTTP request and we're looking for situations where only HTTP but not S are specified, and then you know some host and path that we don't care about. And we can see that we match this one but not this one, which is exactly what we want, um, which is pretty neat. Um, SimGrep has uh, some support for auto fixing things, which is really neat. And so if we return to this like uh, SSL insecure uh, version uh, check from before. Um, what I am going to show here is <clears throat> uh, how to just automatically fix this uh, in your code. So 
up until now, we've been operating on under this simple tab. If you search or if you switch over to the advanced tab, it will show you uh, kind of what's going on under the hood. So what what SumGrep ingests under the hood is a YAML file with a bunch of like keys inside of it to include the patterns that you want to search for here. But one of the keys that it provides is this uh, fix regex, which will do a regular expression replacement, but limited exclusively to the uh, code pattern that you match. And so what we want to do is we want to replace this old version of SSL 3.0 with the highest version of TLS uh, 1.3. And so you can specify this fixed regex key, what you want to replace, what you want to replace it with. And then <clears throat> uh, the editor will give you a preview pane over here, uh, which is a little squished right now because I'm zoomed in to make it easier to see. Um, but you can see here that the version has been upgraded. And then if we click apply fix, it will apply the fix in line uh, automatically. And now this TLS configuration has been updated to be secure, which is awesome. Um, SumGrep has, uh, with the ability to um, capture meta variables, uh, you can uh, start to get really creative with how you use that. And so one of the guys on our team uh, had this idea a while back to, you, to um, use uh, meta variables to output a comma separated value of things. And so uh, this particular example is looking at a Java application that's using Spring and it's enumerating all of the API routes in uh, that application by searching for specific code patterns <clears throat> and then outputting those things as a comma separated value, which you can see over here. Um, and so it will tell you the, like, the method name, the HTTP verb, and if there's a path, it will tell you the path. And then it will also tell you the permission level of that route. And so this is really cool because um, it allows you to like not just search for specific patterns in your code, but allows you to ask questions of your code, such as uh, how many API routes do I have? What is their authorization or authentication requirements? Um, what is the path uh, that, it, that it requires to get there? And so using SEMGREP to like extract a lot of this information, you can then uh, build something like this, which is a visualization of a Python um, uh, application backend <clears throat> that we uh, we're, we're working on for a little bit of time. And as you can see, what, it, what it's doing is it's um, enumerating all of the like uh, uh, functions, but also annotating them with authorization requirements. And so yellow is like, these require some user permissions, green are admin only routes, and red are totally unauthenticated routes. And so we've used this as we've gone in on security assessments of code, <clears throat> where we'll just run it, run this like SEMGREP extractor, route extractor, produce this visualization. And then it gives us an idea right away of like, oh, here are the un unauthenticated routes. Like, let's go start um, looking at those or let's start pen testing those rather than uh, taking the time to like have to figure all that out manually. The last uh, feature. Uh, I want to demonstrate is that we just added uh, something that we're calling the generic uh, pattern matching support or the generic language, which um, we added in order to support things like configuration files. So <clears throat> this is a Terraform example uh, looking for the classic uh, publicly exposed S3 bucket. And um, if we go to the editor, we'll be able to see it. Well, we might be able to see it if it works. There we go. Um, we'll be able to see it work. And so the way to use this is by specifying generic, which doesn't use a, like a normal SEMGREF language parser. It doesn't use Python, doesn't use anything like that. It uses um, a special algorithm that one of our program analysis people developed. And then it allows you to write any pattern generically and uh, to detect these things. And so. Once again, this is a Terraform example. We just finished uh, doing this for a bunch of like our Docker files. So we now have a bunch of like Docker file linting that we're doing, which is really neat. 
So that was a bit of a whirlwind, uh, but that's um, kind of SunGrip how to use in a nutshell. Um, what I want to talk about now is um, automating it because searching code manually for these things is like cool, but uh, guarding your code in a, in a continuous manner is like even cooler. So um, SunGrip has a couple of integrations uh, natively. Um, the best supported is GitHub Actions. Uh, but we also have some support for GitLab and other uh, CI CD providers. You can also run it as a pre-commit hook. <clears throat> but if your CI CD provider of choice is not listed, it is um, easy to add to your pipeline because it's distributed either as a Docker file or a Docker container or as a Linux binary. And we ha have support for um, uh, various uh, easily consumable outputs to include JSON, which makes it really easy to just put the data elsewhere. Um, so because it's easy to install and it's easy to get the data out, um, it's easy to integrate into um, a CICD pipeline. And so this is an example of SimGrip running on our code in a GitHub action. <clears throat> and this is kind of what it looks like. And I'm going to zoom in on the issue here. Um, which if you read it says, has this really long name, but it says Python Flask Security Injection Path Reversal. Um, and then it shows you a line. And so um, this is actually really neat because this is like a real finding that we really had on our real code um, where this path reversal was detected by SimGrip using a rule very similar to the one that uh, I showed earlier. And uh, SimGrip picked it up we had this rule in our CI/CD pipeline, and then it just blocked that um, commit from being made. And so what this means as a security engineer is that this code never went to production. And I can only imagine like if it had, how long would it have been there before somebody had detected it? Would it have required a pen test? Would somebody have discovered it? Worst case scenario, a malicious actor could have gotten to it. But because we were running this in a continuous manner on our code, this code never went public and then never have to worry about it, which is like amazing. <laughs> cool, so, um, so I talked a lot about writing some grip rules, um, but maybe you're sitting there thinking like, I ain't got time for that. Uh, and if you uh, wanna get started with some grip quickly, um, we also maintain a community registry with, I believe we just, rested a thousand rules. So we have more than a thousand rules that are available for your use. Um, so we, uh, we have written a lot of them, but we also have a lot of like really stellar community contributors. So the author and maintainer of Node.js scan, which is a uh, Node.js security scanner has contributed a bunch of JavaScript rules. Um, a gentleman by the name of Damian Grisky who wrote a book called Go Perf Book has a lot of rules that he's contributed we have contributions from OS members and uh, perhaps you, if you're interested in contributing or you have a rule that you think would, the public would benefit from, like you can contribute it very easily. Um, in order to make consumption very easy, uh, they're arranged into sets as, and these are some examples of some of those sets over here. So if you want to download rules and run them that are targeted for cross-site scripting or JWT best practices, um, whatever you like, you might be able to find them there. We're constantly adding more, uh, constantly grouping and adding new rules. Um, <clears throat> so be on the lookout for those as well. Using it is really easy. All you have to do is install SendGrep and then point SendGrep at a configuration URL for those rules and it will just run happily. So if you wanted to run, for example, this GoSec um, set of rules, all you have to do is say SEMGREP dash dash config and then the URL to the uh, set of rules and it will run them. Um, so how might you roll this out on your projects if you're interested in doing so? Uh, we have three primary integration points. You can uh, prototype uh, our VS Code extension um, if you so choose to. Uh, we also have, as I mentioned earlier, support for Git pre-commit. And we also have integrations into various CI CD pipelines. So integrating in them into some or all of these is um, beneficial uh, because it helps uh, run these rules in an automated fashion. Um, we also have a way of managing SimGrep through a user interface that we call SimGrep Community. 
And so if you're using some group community, uh, you also gain the additional power to either um, set rules as blocking or only notifying. And so if you're uh, an AppSec engineer or a security engineer and you're working on a new rule and you're like, eh, I'm not sure this is going to be the best rule ever, you can set it to notify first, which will not block builds, but it'll allow you to monitor its performance to make sure that you don't like overwhelm people or something like that. Um, to get started quickly, you can use existing rules or rule sets. Um, you can group your own rules together if you want to browse through the registry of a thousand rules and pick the ones you like, or you can write your own. Um, and it's very easy to do. You can use the editor that we were using earlier, and then you can click this add policy button and it will um, allow you to uh, deploy a new rule on your code very easily. So all of this like kind of boiled down into a nutshell, the um, continuous integration and the community rules allow you to do this, uh, which I think is really important. And that's to uh, set your security policy in stone with automated scanning. So um, we at R2C, for instance, use um, certain tech stacks. And uh, in October and November, we um, made it our goal to eliminate cross-site scripting from our apps. And the way that we did that is by codifying like, hey, these are all the ways that we can think of that cross-site scripting might happen in our tech stack. And so we're going to write some grid rules for all of these. We're going to provide you with like the secure alternative, the secure recommendation, and we're going to run these things uh, constantly on our code. And so as a result, we've blocked like two, I think, to instances that may have exposed our applications to cross-site scripting. Um, and that's just um, in the past couple of months, which is really cool. Um, so I have like a, a little bit of a case study uh, and I'm not sure when my timer started, but it looks like I might be pretty close to time. So I think I'm gonna skip through this. Um, we have a blog. If you wanna read this case study, uh, you can check it out at the blog. Um, You're okay for time, Grayson, by the way. So feel oh, really? free to elaborate, yeah. Oh, great. Well, I'll go back and, and do that then. Um, so um, a, uh, a case study of like how SEMGREP would, would look in an organization with like developers like constantly writing code and security engineers um, uh, constantly trying to like keep that code secure. Um, this is an example of that and how and a situation that we had at R2C. So the blog is here if you want like the nitty gritty details, but I'm going to surf over them uh, at a high level really, really fast. And so if you haven't been able to tell some of our backends is Python, just because a lot of the examples have been Python. Uh, and so the database engine that we use is SQL Alchemy, which is a Python, did, um, uh, what do they call it? ORM. Uh, and so um, what happened here is that uh, one of our ORMs was managing tokens and secrets. And uh, as we were logging things, those tokens were actually getting logged, uh, which is a super easy mistake to make. Um, I, I feel like uh, almost everyone has done this at some point. And if you haven't, you probably will at some point <laughs> in your career. And so, um, but we didn't want to do that because uh, we didn't want those tokens to be leaked in any way, shape, or form. And so um, one of our engineers came up with this idea, which, is to, which was to write a SQL Alchemy extension called obfuscated string that you can use such that if you try to log it or if you use its string representation in any form, it will blot out the actual string with um, stars or asterisks. And then the way that you use it is in your uh, database model, you specify the database field here and then you use this obfuscated string instead of the regular string. Um, which means that when it gets logged or the string representation of it is used at any point in time, it blots it out like this. And so this is like great, and it's a great, um, great way of automating this, uh, a solution to this problem, rather than telling people like, hey, don't log tokens. It's now, now it's don't log tokens, use this safe alternative, um, which is uh, much easier to employ on a regular basis. But the issue is that um, how do you know which fields to use the obfuscated string for? So if you have a new developer on your team, um, they may make the mistake where they just uh, don't use the obfuscated string. Instead, they use the regular string. 
And so this is where some grip comes into play because you can write a rule um, that says on some uh, field, database field, uh, find a pattern where db string is used. And then you can use this uh, advanced syntax that says the meta variable column must match this regular expression. <clears throat> and what this regular expression is saying is um, any field that has the name token, key, email, or secret, and I think we recently added password, um, SEMGREP will pop up and say, hey, uh, this looks like it might be sensitive information. Do you want to use obfuscated string instead of regular string? And so what we've done now is we've like chiseled in, set in stone a, um, some of our previous knowledge, our security knowledge, and uh, made it so that propagating that knowledge forward happens in a completely automated fashion. And so um, it's not dependent on somebody remembering to tell the new developer, hey, you need to do this. It just happens because it's all built in automatically. Um, and if I pop over to the editor, uh, we can see how this works. So you can see like this one is OK. This one has token in it, but it's using string. And so it gets alerted. That one has secret in it, and it's using string, so it also gets alerted. Uh, yeah, so I'm pretty much at the end um, here. A couple of um, things that are coming up soon. Uh, as I mentioned before, we're always improving our language support um, and adding new languages. We have Kotlin and C Sharp uh, coming soon. We're always adding more rules. And we just recently started publishing uh, cheat sheets to go along with various things that we've learned um, over time. <coughs> um, SimGrip community is always going on improvements. SimGrip community is a way that you can manage your SimGrip installations um, sort of at scale uh, using a user interface. Um, we have the VS Code extension in beta. If you want to test it out, please put goals make issues, file issues, that kind of a thing. Um, and then uh, we're improving our generic pattern support as well, the one that I showed you earlier that matched configuration files um, to get better and better over time. Um, if you want to get started, it's very easy to install. You can install via brew or pip. Or if you want to use the live editor, don't want to install anything, you can try it out there. Um, and that's the end. So. Uh, if you feel so inclined, um, please take this survey here at the bottom, r2c.dev slash survey, um, <clears throat> where we will take that feedback and we, we use this feedback to inform some of our decisions about what we implement next. Um, to include, this is how we decided on Kotlin and C-sharp support. So if you have a language that you want, um, take the survey. Um, you can check out the website, rtc.dev. You can join the community Slack. It's very active, lots of people in there helping each other out all the time. Um, so yeah, that's my talk. Uh, are there any questions? Excellent. Thank you very much, Grayson. Absolutely fascinating talk. And just to remind everyone, you can ask questions using a YouTube chat feature if you're logged into YouTube. Otherwise, if you want to ask your question anonymously, you can ask your question using slide.do slash OWASP website. Uh, so while we're getting these questions, I've actually got a few questions uh, that I picked up while uh, you were speaking, Grayson. So uh, you showed us some sets. So you organized rules into sets, which mm -hmm. is great. But I've only seen sets uh, around vulnerability that cross site scripting. Uh, do you have sets which are, uh, for example, an OWASP top 10 set for Python, just a full set to say OWASP top 10 Python? that kind of stuff. Um, I just think it would be useful in the, because you only show cross-site scripting. Do you have uh, the full OWASP top 10? Yeah, so we do have, we have rules for all of the OWASP top 10 and, um, but we haven't arranged them into packs yet. And so our approach up till now has been focusing on specific vulnerability classes. And so as an example, our next, um, the next pack that we want to publish is for code injection, which on the OS top 10 falls under the injection category, but there's a lot of like injections. Uh, so if we just covered like all injection, it would be very difficult to manage. Um, so we've broken it down into smaller pieces and we're publishing those as we uh, make them. However, what I want to demonstrate is um, if I just click into a 
random rule. Hopefully, it has it. Um, the registry is entirely backed by GitHub. Uh, so, like, if you want to make contributions, all you have to do is make a you know pull request. Um, but one of the things looks like this one doesn't have it. Um, we have some metadata for almost all of our rules, and almost all of them are labeled by um, OAuth top 10 if they're a security rule. So as an example, I'm pulling one up now that um, has this OSP, which falls under the A1 injection. And then usually if they have, usually if they're a security rule, they will also have a, a CWE annotated with it. And so if you wanted to, you can run a bunch of rules and then group them by uh, a WASP or CWE, uh, or you can search through either the registry on the website, or you can search through the GitHub in order to find uh, rules that um, match the specific OWASP top 10 vulnerability. Okay, yeah, that's awesome because I noticed that uh, the sets get flagged, like for example, best practices, right? So, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, if, if uh, somebody wanted to create a set, which is basically OWASP top 10, for Python or for Go, they can actually easily do it uh, using that me metadata. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I have uh, another question and uh, that question is uh, around the uh, um, severity, right? So you showed a couple of examples where severity is warning. Um, is, is that a, an arbitrary severity? For example, in, um, in an enterprise, probably you would want to use something like a high, medium, low, critical, this kind of, uh, is it a label or is it an actual severity? And how does it manifest it itself when you actually, when the rule is actually hit? Yeah, so the three levels of support for severity in SunGrip right now are info, warning, and error. Um, and the severity field has been a subject of much debate uh, in the community <laughs> itself. So many people have requested exactly what you've specified. So sort of the five categories. Um, but right now the severity key is um, specified entirely by the rule author. And so if, so obviously what that kind of does is because it's a community registry, so the different rule authors have different ideas about what severity means. And so for me personally, um, I only use error if it's actually going to like crash the program or, or like nearly 100% introduce a vulnerability. Otherwise, it will be a warning if I'm like not quite so sure. And so some people have brought up, as I've said this uh, to me, that like that's really more of like a confidence measurement than a severity measurement, um, which is true, but we're constantly iterating on things and trying to improve um, the product and uh, that feedback is always useful. So if you have um, any specific requests, the best way to do it is to either ask in the community Slack or to go to the GitHub page and make an issue. Um, and we follow both of those things really closely and um, are, are always uh, looking for the community improvements or community contributions to make uh, improvements based on the feedback. Okay, excellent. Uh, I've got um, a few more questions. Actually, more questions are coming on YouTube, which is great. Um, so uh, the question that I have uh, next is about GitHub Action, right? You mentioned some CI/CD integration. So mm -hmm. uh, GitHub Action is currently available, right? But when it actually finds uh, an issue, uh, fi finds a problem. Does it actually raise a Jira issue, a GitHub issue? Is it like a proper, can, can be used like a DevSecOps pipeline? So when, when, when a, a SEMgrab discovers a um, hit on a rule, uh, will it create a, uh, a ticket? Uh, it will not create a ticket yet. However, we are uh, finishing up work on inline pull request comments. And so if you have a pull request on which it scans, um, SEMgrip will comment the rule message on the line that it had a finding. And so um, that's another example of things that we're building. Uh, so um, someday soon uh, as we work on these things. Okay, wonderful. And uh, there's also a question on the uh, various um, uh, 
CI CD uh, system support. So you, uh, of course, mentioned GitHub Actions. Uh, what about others? Uh, is there support for Azure uh, DevOps, Jenkins, Team CD, and uh, anything other than GitHub Actions? So we have um, the best support is for GitHub Actions and for GitLab. Um, those are the ones that we have people using the most and they come to us and ask for stuff the most. And so that just ends up being the stuff that gets worked on. Um, we are also working on Jenkins integration. We are not working on Azure, Azure uh, pipelines or the other one that was mentioned. I don't remember what it was. However, um, I hope that because the uh, distribution of it is easy, you can either use it as a Docker container or just as like a regular old binary. Um, and because the outputs are easy to work with, that it's easy to integrate with other systems. Now, I do not know for sure because I don't really know the like, you know, the guts of those systems. Um, but that that was the de the design choice that was made on our end to make it to try to make it as easy as possible to integrate with other things. So, if it's not listed, um, hopefully, you know, it's easy to make it work in those environments. Okay. Or as you mentioned, probably because the product is fully open source, is uh, make a pull request and start working on it, right? Exactly. So we had a community member who wanted JUnit XML support for one of his pipelines, and he just added it as an output format, and now it's in the product. So. Wonderful, thank you. I think we've got quite a few questions coming in from YouTube uh, viewers. Andra, can you please um, voice those questions, please? Sure, thank you, Grayson. That was really interesting. Um, the first question is connected to CI CD pipelines and it's about um, the time impact. So, is there a large impact in time when integrating these checks with uh, a CI CD pipeline? Um, I assume that means like runtime. So, yeah. from like, yeah, from like commit time or PR time to finish. Um, so, obviously, like there's some time uh, involved. It's not like days. Um, we, are pretty sensitive to that because we use it ourselves. And so when <laughs> when things start to take a long time, uh, usually somebody will complain and then uh, somebody will go make it faster. <laughs> so um, so the, nice. the, I don't know. I mean, I'm, everybody's experience is different. Um, my personal experience with it is that it takes like under five minutes usually to complete. Um, and we run something like 250 rules on our repository. Um, so one thing worth mentioning is that like the more rules you add, like the longer it's gonna take. Um, uh, but yeah, we, we run something like 250 and it takes under five minutes for us. The, uh, the issue that we have, the, that we struggle the most with is with minified JavaScript files. So uh, minified JavaScript really messes up the, the parser and so to solve this, what we did was we added a timeout flag. So if you decide, you know, I don't want to wait, you know, 30 minutes to process this minified JavaScript file, you can specify a timeout. And the timeout means like this is the max time that any one rule will run on a file, or that any or this is the max time that any one file will be processed. Um, that's what the timeout flag means. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and the second question from YouTube is, if you have a few minutes, can you walk us around the registry? For instance, how would I find and then apply a set of rules to find security vulnerabilities in Ruby? Sure. Um, so I'll do my best. Um, there's um, the, the user interface is pretty much constantly in flight. Like we're always testing and adding new things and sometimes removing them, but I will, um, I will show what's there at least. Um, so on the website, the registry is at slash explore or this explore tab. Um, <clears throat> and there's three tabs up here, explore, rule sets, and rules. Explore is kind of like our just highlighted ones. Um, and so you can see those here. They're loosely grouped into categories, um, as you can see here. Um, if we go over to rule sets, uh, we have a lot of the Right now, we just publicize every every rule set that's made, including uh, community rule sets. So you can see that they're uh, prefixed with usernames, uh, GitHub usernames, for instance. And there's a lot of them in here. And so um, this is probably the page that's had the least amount of love given to it. And so the way you have to search through it is both with good old 
uh, control F and search through it. So if you want to search for something such as Ruby, you can see who has put together a Ruby pack. And if you click into it, um, it will show you the specific rules that are in the pack, uh, which is helpful. And then the last tab is um, all the rules. And so for all the rules, uh, what we can do is um, search by language, by certain categories. Uh, the categories are arbitrary, so they may or may not be helpful. And then by severity, and as I mentioned before, we have info, warning, uh, and error. And then if you can try this, which uses a uh, fuzzy search as well. And so if you're looking for Ruby, you know, if you type in Ruby, it will probably show you all the Ruby rules that we have. Um, and then to group them, currently the way that you have to do that is that you have to use the um, the user interface, and you'll do this by clicking this Add to Policy button. And so you would have to go in and create what's something called a policy, apply that policy to your repository, and then you can add rules to your uh, policy that will be on your uh, repositories. Awesome. Thank you very much.